ranisumab seems to help um, consistently across all populations alone and with chemotherapy. Nish, you were, you were very involved in the bevacizumab development. Um, ramisiramab, it makes only sense now to look at the first line um, treatment of patients with ramisiramab plus chemotherapy. Can you give us your thoughts on where is that going and, and about this dosing I hear about ramisiramab? Yeah. So, um, yes, so the dosing is a very interesting uh, um, issue. So uh, this was actually first uh, thought of in, in um, the TOGA study with another antibody and, and the feeling was that um, in the TOGA study, which was the first line um, gastric study with or without Herceptin Trastuzumab, about a third of patients seemed to have um, a very low trough level, meaning that they were kind of underdosed compared to a breast counterpart. So there was a follow-up study to sort of look at higher dosing of trastuzumab in gastric cancer. That was the Heloise study, and that unfortunately was negative, but it actually established the correct dose of trastuzumab. But similarly, in um, in the Regard and Rainbow study, there was an idea that um, the patients that had the lowest quartile of um, ramisiramab levels at the end of their cycle, those patients did the worst in terms of survival. So uh, with uh, very sophisticated modeling that was done, ramisiramab dose was modified to, instead of um, a, a single dose um, every uh, other week, um, week one and week three, it's actually uh, two out of three weeks um, giving um, dose attacks, I mean uh, ramisiramab in the rainfall study. And, and with that modeling at a higher dose, um, the idea is that more patients will actually um, you know, be above, above that threshold where they may actually achieve benefit. And there's also a second study, a, a second line study of Taxol with two different dose levels of ramisiramab, which will also be supportive evidence of that. So we might even get better data with we might get better data if yeah. we can get everybody's serum levels high enough. Right, that would be very exciting, and and I think we're seeing now this consistent effect of, of anti-angiogenic agents being useful for patients with gastroesophageal cancers. Um, Elena, there's other other agents that we've seen now yes, as well. Yes, uh, sure, of course. Uh, so uh, probably the biggest uh, interest right now in immune oncology and use of checkpoint inhi inhibitors. You know, gastric cancer by its exposure to a lot of insults in uh, mucosa, you know, H. pylori, chronic inf inflammation is prone to uh, very uh, um, quite a bit of DNA damage, and so some of these tumors are hypermutated. And if you look at the muta mutational burden uh, of the tumors that have been historically studied and uh, targeted with checkpoint inhibitors, such as melanoma um, and subtypes of lung cancer, gastric cancer is actually very close to the mutational burden on that spectrum. And uh, you know, the clinical data supports uh, that there are subtypes of gastric cancer that profoundly benefit from uh, uh, PD-1 and PD-L1 inhibition. And particularly, there's a number of drugs on the market. Uh, and uh, in subtypes of gastric cancer, a single agent PD-1 inhibitors, such as nivolumab or pembrolizumab, is likely sufficient. Uh, and that subtype is likely MSI subtype or EBV subtype. The data is still uncertain about whether or not PDL1 immunohistochemistry is an uh, important in, you know, a biomarker. Uh, in short, it's probably is uh, a part of the puzzle of enrichment for the study, but it's a uh, biomarker that is fraught with difficulty because of the uh, methodology and the preparation and the different antibodies that are used. So, uh, and certainly certain pdl one negative patients that uh, also respond. In the majority of our patients, uh, their benefit is very small, and I would say that in unselected patient population, uh, eight to 10 percent of the tumors respond to single agent inhibitors uh, with uh, PD-1 inhibitors. It appears that a dual inhibition with PD-1 and anti-CTLA-4 blockade, uh, this way, so anti-CTLA-4, it, it, it sort of, it, it, you take the brakes off the immune system, and uh, with PD-1 inhibitors, you uncloak the tumor uh, and let the immune system see uh, the tumor. And so in that sense, dual inhibition uh, has a higher uh, response rate. Uh, uh, Checkmate 32 study looked at this and the nivolumab 1, ipilimumab 3 combination, uh, the response rate was 26%. Uh, 
Uh, but as, as you may uh, expect, it comes with a cost of toxicity. So grade three, four toxicity, so potential you know, autoimmune hepatitis um, and autoimmune uh, uh, processes, which most of them are reversible. There wasn't any colitis or dangerous uh, problems like that. Uh, nonetheless, 46% uh, toxicity, uh, which actually, if you look at first line 5 few platinum, very similar <laughs> to 46. It <laughs> right. <laughs> well, it's almost, it's just different uh, toxicities. Instead of neutropenia and uh, uh, febrile neutropenia and neuropathy, you know, uh, these folks get potentially life threatening autoimmune uh, processes. So, um, you know, in, in second and third line setting, uh, immune oncology is really uh, has a, a strong presence, at least in clinical trial development, and the next generation uh, PDL1 inhibitors are out there. And now we're trying to move this into first line uh, setting, and there are a number of first line studies looking at this. Uh, again, not prime time yet, but hopefully coming shortly. Yeah, so certainly exciting this whole concept of immunotherapy where you get your own immune system to attack the tumor. We've seen these responses um, for patients with gastric and even esophageal cancers sure. where the people that respond have, and this is what I think impresses everybody the most, is these durable responses that can Changes their go life. on for years. Um, and they do very well with them. So, so huge clinical trial development area with combinations. And even I think they're looking in the adjuvant setting now right. to see if we can improve yeah. survival. And I actually am working on this trial with Ian, and he keeps stealing all the slots from me, going back to the anti-angiogenic yes. combinations with immunotherapy. Can you tell us a little bit about, there's a, there's a clinical trial, we have a ramiserumab sure. plus a, a PD-1 inhibitor. I would never steal any slots from you. <laughs> Joe, you're just too slow. <laughs> <laughs> so there is an a, a, a initial phase one with an expanded cohort um, of uh, uh, combining ramiserumab with pamelizumab because uh, there are preclinical uh, evidence to say that if you give a, a tumor some low dose angiogenic uh, therapy, you actually change it from an immuno, uh, immuno uh, depressed, suppressive environment to be a mo much more immunosupportive environment. There are also synergistic uh, effects seen in uh, preclinical models of adding pd one with a, a VGF receptor 2 antibodies. So based on that, you know, they uh, one have conducted a, a, a phase one study uh, combining the two. Uh, the safety results was actually reported in ASCO, uh, and certainly the two uh, drugs itself are very, very safe, hardly any grade 3, 4 toxicity or even grade 2 toxicities. Uh, but the, they, they have done it in different cohorts. So they for gastric cancer, they actually done it in two separate doses scheduled cohorts initially uh, because um, they uh, did what uh, managed it, you know, the, the higher, kind of higher PK uh, cohort, so day one, day eight ramiserumab in conjunction with pamelizumab given every three weeks. Uh, and then they have a lower uh, dose uh, ramiserumab cohort um, to try to take into account those preclinical evidence of, of a lower dose antigenic um, with, with uh, pamelizumab. Uh, so for those two uh, cohorts, they have fully recruited. Uh, we've got some safety data, as I said, in ASCO, uh, and hopefully the efficacy data will be presented uh, in uh, early next year. Um, and uh, they've now actually opened new cohorts in gastric cancer in people who are chemo naive to uh, metastatic uh, uh, gastric cancer. So these are, um, in a way, uh, doing some other uh, companies doing with the two dual checkpoint inhibition. So they are, uh, are given uh, that uh, patients who are um, uh, who are naive to cytotoxic chemotherapy and you give them the, the combination. But I think probably Yelena and Manish and you, you can probably echo that, you know, you do need to uh, select your patients carefully about who Absolutely. you want to give immuno. Uh, uh, on college, you know, IO compounds because I don't think it's really suitable for everyone, and it's not really just the biomarker you're saying. You really have the patient in front of you, the physical condition of it, and you decide whether this is someone you can wait for. Uh, you know, I, you know, IO compounds to work. And I don't know whether you want to comment a bit on that as well. Yeah, no. absolutely. You know, the time to response for these patients uh, can be, uh, you know, six, 12 weeks. So in the patient who is symptomatic, presenting with obstructive symptoms or peritoneal carcinomatosis, uh, it's probably not, uh, you know, an ideal option. Uh, but the future is the combination therapies. In fact, uh, we're doing a trial for combination of trastuzumab 
with PD-1 inhibitor, and hopefully as we built on the complex biology of gastric cancer, the responses and the time to response for some of these immuno-oncology drugs will improve.